Hey everyone, welcome to Flywheel Pod, your number one source for everything Frax, DeFi, and everything in between. If you want to know what's going on in the world on chain, you've come to the right place. This is DeFi Dave, here with Capital K, and we're here to help you harness the power of the flywheel. And talking about, you know, upgrading the flywheel, really taking it to the next level, we have on Mr. Sam Kazmian himself, the founder and architect of Frax, to talk about what's new at Frax, what they're planning, and, you know, and kind of a review of their latest release of products. Um, this was a really cool episode because, you know, we touched on so many new topics, uh, especially the Fed Master account, which sounds like one of the coolest ideas I've heard um, in the stablecoin and crypto space overall. So, Kit, what are your thoughts? I mean, the, the moment Sam started talking about the FMA, in my mind, for some reason, it just flashed a scene from Game of Thrones where Daenerys is like, oh, I'm not going to stop the wheel. I'm going to break the wheel. And that's what I feel <laughs> Sam's about to do to the whole flywheel. I'm going to become the wheel. <laughs> yeah, like, this is it. Like, once we have an, an FMA, that, like, I really hope the audience, like, pay attention and really listen to what that uh, really means and all the implications. It, it is a dense topic. So, you know, please bust mm -hmm. out your notepad and listen intently and like write down the notes and you can do some research on your end afterward. But man, this was a good yeah. damn pod. Yeah. Honestly, it's such an ambitious idea, like going straight to the jugular and just focusing on one thing. It's like, what is the RWA that matters most if you want to be the central bank, not just like any bank, not just a commercial bank, but the central bank of DeFi and it's the uh, Fed master account. So, you know, I encourage everyone, you know, as Kit said, listen close, get those notes down. And then we also get into, you know, updates on FPI. We go get into update, you know, how Fraxith has been doing. You know, a lot of people have been like coming with me to with critiques. I make sure to touch on all of those. This is a really good wrap up of an episode, especially, you know, coming towards the end of the year and actually to the two year anniversary that Frax has been live. Yeah, man, I, I think this the, the audience is in for a treat and we're here to deliver the banger again right before yeah. Thanksgiving. So right uh, before, we were very yeah. appreciative and thankful of you guys to kind of help us knock down all of our milestone and <laughs> subscriber goals and stuff. So, you know, upward and onward. Yeah. You know, we always supply, try to supply content you can't find anywhere else. And I think we really shine th through with flying colors here. So, you know, without further ado, we'll get into it. But before we do, make sure you like, subscribe, content, hit that bell button on our YouTube. You know, we were trying to get to 10K subscribers, you know, one step at a time, one subscriber at a time, but we'll get there. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at FlywheelPod. Don't forget to hit us up on Telegram and join our group at FlywheelPod. You can follow me on Twitter at DeFiDave22. You can follow me at 0x capital underscore K. And let's get the flywheel spinning. Today we have a very special episode with the founder of Frax, Sam Kazemian. We're going to go over the whole state of Frax, how everything's shaping up, and what future exciting plans Frax has in the pipeline. Sam, thanks for coming on. It's good to be back, guys. Hey. To just get this started, you know, there's been a lot of uncertainty. It's been a roller coaster the past few weeks in crypto. Um, and what everyone's wondering is, what do you think is the current state of Frax? How is Frax made out? Are there any remaining risk? And how do you see Frax moving forward from here? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I won't really get into the FTX specific stuff because I think everyone's talking about it like ad nauseum. But uh, overall, you know, to be clear, uh, Frax has had no um, indirect or direct or any kind of exposure to anything uh, in that ecosystem, Alameda loans, FTT, nothing of the sort at all. And so Frax has actually done a very good job of, uh, you know, always being entirely on chain, not having any of those kinds of loans and anything like that. So we've, we've actually been completely, completely great. Um, our, our peg has been entirely, uh, perfect. It's, it's entirely been good through the like Terra stuff and, and everything else. So, um, everything's good. Uh, there's a lot of stuff we're working on, as you guys know, um, in terms of like the Trinity, Frax ETH recently, and we're just chugging along. And I think, you know, obviously the market's pretty brutal, but you know, uh, this is the time to build and, and not really care about that. Yeah. Uh, one thing that Scoopy said previously on our last podcast with him is not only has Frax, you know, with the AMOs that created a way for stablecoin growth to scale up. 
but you basically created an efficient and safe way for stablecoins to scale down in times of duress. So is are the AMOs playing out uh, as, as you thought? Are there anything that you like are they surprised about about how the AMOs are working? Uh, they've been really good. I mean, they've just been basically for for people that uh, are just mainly tuning in. Frax has these smart contracts called algorithmic market operation smart contracts, and they typically control uh, curve pool uh, liquidity or liquidity on AMMs, or also uh, minted Frax and lending markets and things like that. Um, they've they've been fantastic, and they've they've done exactly as we've uh literally hoped and, and and designed so the main thing is the the protocol owned liquidity and also the the lock liquidity that keeps frax basically um uh, mathematically in peg there's more than enough protocol and liquidity for every user owned frax right now to actually sell into curve into uniswap into frax swap and all these places and get a dollar of value out and i think this ability to actually verify this you don't have to trust me saying this on this podcast you can actually verify it on chain and people have they've even reached out to me many times like hey i'm doing the math here like you know where's you know where's this lock liquidity or is, is that locked or is this uh you know all protocol owned etc cetera, etc cetera. it all checks out especially with people you know looking at it on chain and uh that's that's why frax's peg has been uh really resilient and the the other stuff that we're, we're building towards will actually make frax even safer and actually probably change the uh, outlook and structure of how Frax will actually uh, be in terms of a, a dollar peg stablecoin. And that's one of the things I'm interested in like talking about uh, in terms of like kind of a hybrid stablecoin and kind of what the end game here is is going to be in my opinion, where, what the stablecoin end game is. As you guys know, one of the main things I kind of pride myself on is being a stablecoin maximalist, always being, you know, uh, at the forefront of like stable stablecoin design, what things are happening in stablecoins, what's the best way for Frax to be at the top of the, the stablecoin game and, and all this stuff. So um, we're actually thinking, you know, over, you know, the next six to 12 months, I think Frax is going to have some interesting new uh, design implementations and considerations that uh, will make it significantly even safer than what it already is, but also uh, make it even more unique and actually provide a unique value proposition that I don't think uh, any other stablecoin has really tackled yet. Yeah, so is, um, you're thinking about, and what do you think is the end game overall is for Frax? Yeah, so one of the things I've been thinking about is I'm actually not very bullish on real world assets uh, when I was before. Um, and the reason for that is so once upon a time, uh, back during the bull market, right? One of the main narratives was that, oh, like in order for stable coins to scale, right? They're, they're going to need to actually uh, create loans and, and things like that uh, to productive businesses and, and, and stuff, right? If, if real world, you know, credit creation and, and stuff like that is not going to be uh, connected to, you know, on-chain stable coins, then, you know, it's, it's all just like a digital casino or something like that, right? In order to really increase the supply of, you know, decentralized stable coins like DAI and FRAX and things like that, we have to do real world assets and loans. And I actually, uh, I actually drank that Kool-Aid. I actually bought that narrative uh, for a while. I actually don't think that's the case. Uh, what I think is that there's, there's only going to be one, uh, real world asset and and there should only be one real world asset if the goal of a stablecoin project is to reach multiple trillions and actually be you know a essentially the central bank of defi rather than a commercial bank uh that's just trying to maximize profit right and and that real world asset that single thing is dollars deposited at the Fed in, in a Fed master account, right? Not even treasuries at like a commercial bank or something like that, but literally uh, a Fed master account, which basically for, for people that don't know kind of the, the TradFi kind of lingo, it's that every large bank, uh, and with exception, some other things like credit unions or, or somewhat smaller community banks and things like that can apply to the Federal Reserve to actually deposit dollars directly on its own ledger. In fact, you don't believe real world assets are the way that stablecoins are going to get to trillions of dollars in circulation and in market cap. But you do think the one real world asset worth pursuing is having a master account at the Fed. So, you know, one thing that you've also said is Frax is a protocol that's completely on chain. 
It only operates on chain. All its assets and reserves and collateral are on chain. So how will Frax go about going into the real world and getting a master account at the Fed if it's completely on chain? Yeah, so there, there's a few things that actually before we get there, I, mm -hmm. I want to lay out in terms of like what uh, we're doing and like how we're thinking about this. One is that uh, you guys have done a great job explaining the stablecoin trilemma, right? And and so like we've actually had a previous uh, episode when, when I was on and then also another talk with Amin and, and things like that about the stablecoin trilemma, which says, you know, between decentralization, uh, peg and, and scalability, there's this uh, trilemma that you can pick two, but not three, right? And so you have situations where, you know, things are like decentralized and scalable, like like Terra and their their peg is terrible, right? They like DPEG. And then you have things like decentralized collateral uh, with a decent peg like LUSD, but they're not scalable at all. They're never going to actually uh, be able to increase supply. There's no evidence that, that they can. Some people say they can, but, you know, we're, we're still waiting for that, right? And then so there's the other, there's kind of the current Frax and, and die approach, which is, you know, the peg is great. Um, the, it, it's scalable, but it's not uh, entirely decentralized collateral. There's a lot of uh, fiat coin exposure, right? Frax through its, you know, curve AMOs, which actually shields it from blacklist risk, right? Because uh, all of the stable coins, the fiat coins that Frax essentially transitively controls is deployed in, in large pools on curve. So, you know, unless the, you know, Circle or Tether or any of these fiat coins are going to blacklist the entire curve pools, uh, they can't exactly blacklist Frax as a protocol. However, uh, you know, still that is uh, fiat coin exposure. And again, fiat coins, you could essentially say that they're tokenized uh, dollars, right? And there's there's basically the, the reason that I came to this conclusion of, you know, in order for um, Frax to actually be one of the stable coins that are competing for the, the trillion dollar market, right? In the next five to 10 years in crypto, there will be multiple stable coins that are uh, multiple trillions in, in market cap, right? The way to do that is by trying to be the central bank kind of issued digital currency of DeFi. That doesn't mean the government central bank. That means DeFi central bank, almost like a decentralized central bank, right? And the way to do that is not to take on risky private sector loans, right? If you, if you consider what um, real world assets are, right? What maker DAO's doing, which is great. And, and again, I'm not the, the kind of person here to say, you know, one like, you know, method is is wrong. It's just different. And, and the advantages are different. So for example, if you have DAI and there's a lot of real world assets that are going to back DAI, right? Like like Tesla loans, private company loans, and, and these kinds of things, right? That's riskier than lending the literal federal reserve dollars right like there's there's nothing possibly uh more risk free than depositing dollars at the fed's literal balance sheet like uh, on the fed's actual ledger right with 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 actual, actual master account there's literally nothing uh by definition like less risky in terms of loans denominated in dollars right and so the the stable coins that look the most like this currently today is a circle, but they also don't have like like a Fed master account, but they are entirely backed by treasuries that are, you know, um in a in a like a custodial trust setup. So it's you know protected by creditors, but it's also um in a uh private company and then like a private kind of banking setup, right? But it's the closest. It's the closest thing uh is is USDC, which is just entirely filled with US treasuries. Again, similar to just loaning the US government dollars, which is by definition, the safest thing you can do. So what does that mean? That means that USDC almost looks blacklist risk aside for, for a brief second. It looks like the most risk-free thing. And that's why you have essentially DAI and, you know, admittedly FRAX and, and, and things like that, that need to partially essentially back themselves with the, the risk-free stable coin in, in the actual DeFi landscape. And again, Risk-free, this 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 excludes the blacklist risk, which is kind of a socio-political and regulatory risk, not like an economic uh, risk, right? We're just, for, for example, right now looking at things economically. And if you think about DAI, for example, that's like partially backed by USDC and then, you know, soon going to be backed by a bunch of interesting real-world asset loans, 
that's great. They're going to make a bunch of profit with the real world asset loans because presumably those loans have to return higher than you know the four percent, which is the the the, the Fed interest rate, which. Uh, again, actually, is distributed through the Fed master accounts. You deposit if you're a bank directly with the Fed. When you know Jerome Powell comes up and says we're we're going to raise things by 75 bips, you know what he actually means is the Fed master account balances are going to have uh, interest on the reserve balances increased by 75 bips. That's actually the translation of what it means. And so, um, obviously, like Treasuries and things adjust like that, right? People uh, might sell Treasuries to actually deposit the cash into uh, master accounts, like large banks that have those. Uh, master accounts. And the thing to consider here is that DAI will just basically look like a more risky version of like USDC, right? Blacklist risk aside, if you think about it, right? What's more likely to default on, on their loan? Tesla, which is, is a private company or the Federal Reserve that you have dollars deposit or, or like the US government, right? That that you've bought treasuries that they've repaid all their dollars when when it matures, right? And so clearly the the least risky thing is the closest it gets to literally the actual issuer of of dollars, right? And what's going on is basically USDC right now is essentially taking the the kind of role as the closest thing of issuer to risk-free dollars. Again, for, for a brief moment, forget the blacklist risk. We're going to obviously visit that uh, again, right? And we all obviously have an answer to this in terms of the structure, but but just pretend the blacklist stuff that is, is not there, right? If you just look at DAI and you just look at USDC, USDC becomes basically the risk-free uh, base, right? And then the real world, quote, quote, asset loans of like private companies and like random banks and stuff. I think there was like uh, a die loan to Huntington Valley Bank or, or whatever um, that was. They also, they're, they're clearly riskier than, than just being entirely backed by dollars at the Fed or treasuries, right? And so you always have a situation where there's a risk premium on anything that has real world assets that are not treasuries or fed dollars always right i mean like there's always a risk premium with with die backing itself more as that right so then then the litmus test becomes okay is this risk premium worth it to have like you know the the lack of a blacklist function right because then the, the main differentiator at that point becomes uh true non-custodial nature right or or like, is there literally a blacklist function directly with the ability for, for my wallet address to basically get uh, it, it, its things seized, right? And that's why when I started thinking about things as like, what is the actual uh, role of being the central bank of, of DeFi, right? Again, I don't mean like an or Orwellian central bank or whatever, any of these things. I actually have a lot of uh, my views on regulation and things are very similar to Eric Voorhees's, which uh, I think a lot of people saw that um, bankless episode with SPF and and uh, Eric Voorhees, and he did uh, Eric did such a good job articulating all this stuff. So when I say like a central bank kind of stablecoin, I don't mean literally like the the state central bank. I just mean the thing by definition that's the least riskiest, right? The least riskiest uh, economical liability of a dollar, right? Right now that's USDC, right? I mean, if again, if you cut out the blacklist talk for a second, I think it's undeniable that that's USDC. And so USDC has the highest chance of becoming the stable coin that gets to um, the trillion dollar mark and above. And with, with no uncertain terms, Frax's goal is to be one of those stable coins that are in the trillions. Our, our goal is not to become, you know, uh, a very profitable middling kind of you know commercial bank kind of thing that you know issues you know, some some stable coin but that it's like very happy to you know have 50 billion in circulation while like you know USDC has like two trillion or something like that right it it wants to and our goal and our vision from the very beginning is whatever the the look is of of a stable coin that needs to be the base kind of risk free asset uh, in DeFi, we want to actually pursue that design, both in terms of technology and, and economics, right? And that's my view is I don't think it's possible to have real world assets of like private companies and things like that 
and gun for that that uh, position at the top. That so that that's the first realization that for me as, as someone that's kind of architecting and, and proposing the roadmap of like fracks and obviously a lot of these things have to go through governance decisions because it's not just me but you know usually uh i i try to articulate things that um most of the time not all the time but but fairly most of the time uh be because things have been going well you know fxs holders and voters have have passed uh some of these things so my view is no real world assets other than one real world asset and that one real world asset is dollar deposits at the federal reserve okay and that is the economic ideal now obviously there's a lot of you know hoops to you know jump through to get to get there and, and these kinds mm -hmm. of things and usually i don't like to really talk about those things because it's all just like you know what ifs or like what about the application what about regulators or this or that or whatever and and you know uh those are just you know part of the fun so to speak to try to make sure to do this right and and actually uh become you know literally the first uh you know to be able to actually get something like this kind of uh achievement and i think um in terms of structure i think this is how, how to do it i i just don't see how lending you know risky you know, private companies that can default that we see default nonstop all the time. And in, in these, in these like market conditions and everything, uh, how is it actually going to be the case that that stable coin backed by a bunch of those kinds of loans is ever preferred over something like, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. a stable coin, for example, like Frax, if we can get you know, uh, a master account at the Fed, or realistically, even if if we can't, if Circle does, right? Like, let's be real. Like, who would prefer other than purely for the blacklist risk, right? Uh, risky loan backed private, uh, you know, stable coin full of real world assets, or just one real world asset, which is just a deposit at uh, the Fed. And in fact, one thing that's uh, even better is. If you look up how a Fed master account works, every uh, end of business day, the actual Fed will give you a attestation of what your balance is. So you don't even need to hire a mm -hmm. uh, private audit firm and, and anything. Like literally, you will get a daily balance of uh, what your reserves are at the Fed. So like that's uh, that's also done for you straight from the Fed. So that also is kind of a nice cherry on top. So Sam, you've clearly gave us such, you know, the overview benefit of the greatness of this FMA. But, you know, let's also be real. It's extremely difficult to get an FMA, right? You know, um, Dave and I did, did some research prior to the call here, and there are clearly six principles that the, that the Fed kind of takes a look at to evaluate any applicant. And, you know, I also know that there are kind of three tiers in the way they evaluate each applicant. And obviously crypto is going to be the utmost highest risky tier, right? So I, I kind of want to walk through Frax's tactical plan on how to implement this because everything you said sounds fantastic, right? Why would we not want the number one RWA that matters the most, that is the safest and also generates such great yield? Like, Clearly, we want that. But now let's address the first principle, like the legal eligibility of it. Like, you know, Frax, like Dave said, is an on-chain entity. And how would you go about creating a legal entity? Or is there a Frax.LLC? Or like, how does that structure work now that you're literally going off-chain? Yeah, I, I kind of don't want to talk actually <laughs> too much about it because okay. there's so many what-ifs and things because when it comes to these kinds of situations. But what I will say that the most important thing is um, uh, two things. One is that I'm very, uh, very uh, cognizant of the fact that whatever structure uh, we do, and there's multiple ways to do it. Um, and in fact, if you're listening to this or, uh, you know, you're in um, traditional finance or this is something that's really interesting to you and you're in the frax community or just in, in DeFi in general and want to help out with this please reach out to us because we have an active uh you know group that's like looking into this and we you know we'd love to bring people on board to help us but what i will say is um i don't like any structure that has perverse 
uh, incentive. So if we actually get one, uh, FXS holders will have to transitively actually govern whatever kind of like either nonprofit structure or uh, bank structure there is. And what I mean by perverse incentives and, and things like that is, for example, uh, one thing we should always avoid is something like Yuga Labs and, and the structure that they have. So for people that, that know, Yuga Labs created uh, Board Ape NFTs and things like that, right? And then they also created the Ape token. Well, what they also did is they basically created a bunch of equity and then they sold it for, I think, like hundreds of millions of dollars to Andreessen Horowitz and, and uh, you know, VCs and things like that, right? And this is, I've, I've, we've seen this so many times, time and time again, right? Where, you know, you have, um, you have like a kind of distributed group of, group of developers and it is actually pretty decentralized and it starts out with the community and things like that. And then you create this like centralized company with equity and you then sell the equity. And so now you actually have your main incentive is to make the equity worth a lot, right? Rather than actually work on making the, the tokens or the community or the entire aspect of this kind of distributed system uh, worth a lot, right? And so for example, I actually, uh, the, the main thing I'll say is at the end of the day, like FXS holders have to be able to have total control. This can't be like a, um, you know, like a private bank that goes up and, and does its own thing. And then like, you know, uh, Frax is kind of like one of its customers. Otherwise we just work with like, you know, a bank, right? Like then that, that, that would just totally be self-defeating in, in terms of the point we have to have. Uh, and by we, I mean, the you know, the FXS holders, right? All of the distributed amount of FXS holders have to be able to have uh, control of their own destiny. In fact, like control the entire stack in, in, the, in this kind of like financial ecosystem. That's why we built the Trinity for the on-chain stack, the only one real world asset that we should uh, give our, you know, significant attention uh, is this kind of Federal Reserve master account and not these like plethora of random, you know, you know, this car loaner, this random bank loaner, this real world loaner, this kind of this or that. It's just one thing and it needs to be structured properly. It shouldn't be structured like Yuga Labs uh, equity or like these other things where it's very obvious that there's there's misaligned incentives, right? And so mm -hmm. whenever I, I, I look at how to create uh, a you know crypto system that can actually function and it's decentralized and it and it sustains itself. Um, the the first thing is to always resi resist some kind of like weird structures that you know might have short term benefits. Like oh, let's like incorporate a company. I'm sure we could sell the equity for like a, a bunch of like uh, money or something, and the tokens are worth something. It's to avoid that kind of stuff that that short termism kind of view. That sounds really good, right? Um, but in the end, it, it kind of like dooms you you to failure, right? Like for example, the Ethereum Foundation could have been a for-profit company, and I'm sure like Vitalik could raise like billions of dollars at, at this point if if it was a pro uh, a private company, right? But it's not, and that's actually part of the reason uh, Ethereum is so you know ideologically pure, right? It's because there's just there's an avoidance of kind of the the corrupting perverse incentives, and so. The, the one thing I'll say is like, however we structure it, it has to be true to crypto's ethos. It has to be true to the things that, you know, uh, for example, Eric Voorhees was saying in in the, you know, debate with SPF on Bankless. And, you know, if, if that's out, something that's cool to you, you know, if whoever's listening to this in the Frax community, DeFi community, or even in traditional financial experience here, uh, we'd love to talk to you about it. Because like, that is one of the things that, that we're doing now. There's a lot of things Frax is doing. So I hope we can also talk about Frax yeah, and yeah. Frax Ferry and FBI yeah. and stuff. But this is one of the new things that I think is one of the most uh, exciting and important thing is basically the real world asset kind of division or department is actually the Fed master account department is uh, how I like to say it now. Yeah, for sure. Um, really exciting development. I like how Frax is just focusing on one thing. And in a way, Frax gets that Fed master account, it's like a quasi CBDC in a sense, because it's getting, you know, the interest straight from the source. And in a way, you can't get closer to like dollars itself than the Fed. And if Frax has that master account and is able to back Frax with like you were saying in the chat earlier that I saw with like FRX USD, it provides some really, you know, interesting ways that Frax can expand. But yeah, uh, let's definitely get into the uh, other parts of Frax that shift because you guys have been you know, heads down building 
over the past four or five months, releasing a plethora of new products, the most recent of which has been Fraxith. And, you know, you guys have seen spectacular growth there. You know, what are your thoughts on the growth of Fraxith so far? You guys just passed 17,000 ETH that have been uh, converted from ETH to Fraxith. Congrats on that. So what are your overall uh, thoughts and reflection on the growth of Fraxith? Yeah, definitely. Uh, Fraxith has been going great. In fact, it's been going uh, exactly as uh, hoped for and planned so far. So that that's fantastic. Um, a little bit of quick background about the design for anyone that, that's uh, interested to, to check it out. So Fraxith is actually a two token design. So there's when you come with uh, one ETH and you deposit it in the in the contract, what you get is you get one Frax ETH uh, token. And that's always backed one-to-one -one by, by one ETH, whether it's like staked and validators, or you can redeem it from the contract and things like that. It's always, uh, fully collateralized by one ETH at minimum. And the interesting thing is you can then take that, uh, frax ETH and it's just an ETH stable coin. It does not, uh, it does not give you interest. It's not rebasing. It does not have any kind of properties. It's literally just called Fraxy and it's an ERC-20 token. Obviously it's like updated, it has like gas efficiencies, it has permit functionality and all the new uh, ERC-20 uh, EIP improvements and, and things like that, but it's just a token. And you can go and you can stake it in the uh, S Fraxy vault, which stands for stake Fraxy And that vault is an ERC-4626 uh, compliant vault. And that is interest bearing and the interest bearing uh, S frac ETH, all of the uh, interest comes from proof of uh, stake rewards from validators that, that are run by the protocol. And so all of the proof of stake rewards minus the, the protocol fee and, and stuff, it goes directly to uh, S frac ETH vault. And a lot of people at first were thinking, well, why this weird design? Why, why two tokens? Why is there Frax ETH, this like random kind of ETH stable coin? We don't need an ETH stable coin. You do just, there's just ETH. What's the point of that? And, and then why isn't it all just S Frax ETH, right? Because if, you, if you're familiar with Steeth, right, which is uh, Lido's liquid staking derivative, it's a rebasing token. So every single day, uh, Lido has an Oracle that checks how much rewards all of Lido's validators have earned, right? And it actually pushes an update to all of the Steeth token holders is balanced. So when you literally look at your balance on uh, MetaMask or you do balance of in, in like a smart contract, it returns a higher balance. So your balance actually goes up in, in Steeth. And it's essentially a rebasing kind of positive interest bearing token, right? Now, the interesting thing about us separating this is that if you stake in the s Steeth vault, you can basically be sure that you will always get the, the risk-free rate, because what happens is as we start building a lot of different integrations, right? So like right now, the curve pool is a really, really uh, good place to stake Frax ETH against ETH, right? It's like a Frax ETH uh, pool. So there's liquidity so people can uh, enter and exit, right? And you can stake there and you can get a high APR from uh, CRV, CVX, and FXS rewards, right? And as people go over there to stake their Fraxy, there's less people staking in the S Fraxy vault, right? So there's basically less people in the vault that share more of the, the POS rewards, right? Let's say there's other places that Fraxy uh, gets integrated, let's say in, in like lending markets or, or other places, right? Then there's places you can go and deposit it there and get uh, interest payment, right? People will, will pay you to borrow it or, or short it or, or things like that, right? And you go over there and if you deposit Fraxy there or you go and balance or, or wherever else that, that there's more and more integrations coming, there's less people in the S Fraxy vault, right? That share the growing POS rewards. So like that basically becomes the de facto risk-free rate of staked Fraxy, right? And so that's a really powerful thing. You can basically just stake it in the vault and, and move away and, and just like literally forget about it because you know the market will always arb that rate to basically the, the risk-free rate by other people going and taking whatever other risk they want with their frac seat, right? Risk-adjusted uh, returns. And so this is pretty elegant in contrast to, for example, with Steve, you always have to find the, the best place to uh, stake your Steve because 
Otherwise you miss out, right? Because everyone is getting the rebase rewards, right? So you have to basically go and stake it in the curve pool, right? Right now, that's probably the, the best uh, lowest risk place to additionally stake it. But then you have to also keep in mind, okay, what if the curve pool rewards end? Or like, what if what if Lido stops distributing uh, LDO tokens in the curve pool? Then everyone moves away and like some other place becomes the, the main place to deposit Steve. Maybe it's in uh, Ave, right? And like, oh, I, I was away for six months. I didn't know and I like missed all of that, right? And the cool thing with uh, as Frax ETH is if you just stake it in the vault, the market does the rest because the market has to choose new participants and other participants have to choose where they put their Frax ETH stablecoin, right? And the Frax ETH stablecoin balances out all of the different places that will integrate it. In fact, one of the uh, interesting ideas I saw that I hadn't even really thought about uh, is that some people were saying when withdrawals open uh, for, you know, after Shanghai, you know, you could probably replace Frax ETH with WEATH in a lot of, you know, uh, Uniswap pairs or, or liquidity pairs in, in different places because Frax ETH is literally an ETH stablecoin. It has gas optimizations. It has permits, which um, allow you to sign a signature approved rather than two separate transactions, right? It has all of the state-of-the-art ERC-20 functions and, and EIP improvements, and it's and it's an ETH stablecoin. And once withdrawals are open, it, it's always going to be literally worth one ETH because you could basically unwrap it for ETH the same way you can unwrap WEATH, right? So you can actually start integrating FRAX ETH uh, anywhere you, you kind of want, right? And it's a very smooth kind of system of starting from DeFi primitives and kind of building up these things from, you know, the, the, the fundamental building blocks. And so, so far it's been, it's been great, right? So we have the curve pool growing very quickly. Like you said, we have about 17,000 uh, total Frax ETH minted, which means one-to-one -one, there's uh, around 17,000 uh, ETH in our validators, right? And uh, you can view that on fax.frax.finance. And that's basically our analytics suite for all of the uh, Frax infrastructure, like Frax ETH, Frax Lend, uh, gauges, and Frax wall pools, and all this stuff. And so far, it's been great. Obviously, we want to make sure to work constructively with all of the the big players because, uh, at a certain sense, obviously, um, we think this design is good and stuff. But on a, on a certain different level. I, I don't think it's it's something that we're not trying to do this at the expense of Rocket Pool or Lido or something like that. In fact, uh, we're launching with Balancer a SFRAX, ETH, Steeth, and Reef uh, staking pool. And so what's really cool about that is any any of these liquid staking derivatives, you can come, you could swap it for the other, you can LP it, you can basically have this kind of index of these three uh, large ones, and we're planning to support that, right? We're planning to uh, put incentives there or do like bribe voting incentives and things like that and just kind of try to lift everyone up together right and hopefully uh, Lido and Rocket Pool and stuff feel the same way and it's not about like can we take you know their piece of the pie it's like can we actually increase the size of the pie for for all of us right mm -hmm. and that's kind of how we've thought about it we just obviously fine-tune some of these things in, in our opinion uh, what is advantageous for the, the Frax ecosystem as a large stablecoin issuer. Uh, we have a lot of experience kind of issuing uh, stablecoins. So Frax ended up being an, an ETH stablecoin, which is kind of cool. Yeah, I remember in Amsterdam, when we had the first ever Fraximus meetup, you popped in on FaceTime and you're just uh, thinking about Frax ETH and you told the idea to everyone there. And that was back in April. And now today it's November. So that's like seven, eight months later, you came up with it. Uh, which is like really amazing, you know, turnaround from when it was just an idea to where it is now. Um, another thing I wanted to ask is, could this like Fraxeth model be used for other blockchains? Like could you have like maybe like Fraxmatic or, you know, maybe Frax Solana or Frax Avex um, and apply the, these this structure to other validators on different chains? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, um, like you said, we're we're known for for shipping uh, quality stuff uh, quickly, but efficiently and securely. We've never had any uh, exploiter or lost user funds, which is great. Um, we get all of these audited by Trail of Bits, Code Arena, and and kind of like others and everyone internally. But um, yeah, wanted to just give shout out to everyone that's actually made this possible, like Drake, Dennis, Justin, Rich, Travis, 
Nader, Jack, Alex, these guys are on the core team and they've they've literally are the are the reason, to be honest, that we've been able to ship so much great stuff. And uh we can do it for other chains. So in, indeed. Um right now, like for example, we could do it for like Matic staking or, or AVAX and, and things like that, and kind of do the same exact kind of structure and essentially issue like for example a matic stable coin right like fraxmatic and then uh the the fraxmatic vault and, and and things like that um we're focusing obviously mainly on frax ETH because it is by far the largest market in fact um one thing the bear market has kind of made all of us realize and uh it, it, it made kind of FTX also realize this, but minus the literal like fraud is that you don't want to expand too quickly, right? You don't want to just try to put your hand in every every single thing uh, all at the same time. In fact, some people say that already with so many products and stuff we have, but we do this because it's part of the, the end game roadmap, right? It's part of our uh, vision. And, um, but the stuff that's not part of our vision, like the, you know, spreading very quickly to every other chain, like staking derivative or something, uh, we're going to try to avoid that until there's an actual uh, really, really, you know, obvious need for it. But yes, the answer is yes, we can, but we don't have any plans to do it. Uh, and we're entirely focusing on Fraxy for the foreseeable future. Got it. And Sam, I actually wanted to go back to the whole, you know, um, risk-free rate that, that you had mentioned earlier with uh, S Frax Eve. Like, is there a target rate kind of in your mind when you allocate the bribes and the incentives to the curve pool so that there's always, you know, a target percent of staked Frax ETH that you want? Yeah. So actually that's a, that's a good question. So there's this thing we call uh, the withhold ratio and it's not a collateral ratio because like I said, uh, Fraxy is always at minimum one to one back. It's actually a tiny bit over collateralized right now, right? Because as profits come in, uh, the the small part that the protocol takes uh, gets actually stored partly in like an insurance fund uh, for for any like you know slashing condition or anything like that. But um, yeah, there's a thing called the withhold ratio, which means how much of that ETH actually does not get staked in validators, and that actually gets uh, deployed as protocol control liquidity through a curve ammo. In fact, so we have a, like a curve ammo for the Frax ETH, ETH pool, right? And mm -hmm. it's because of this that we are able to have a, uh, you know, more high fidelity peg right now than, for example, Steve. Now, obviously, Steve has a much higher TVL. So, you know, it's kind of mm -hmm. an unfair comparison because it's easier to stabilize like 30 mil TVL rather than like, a, like 800 million, right? But as uh as the size gets as it gets bigger i think you know our ability to do this with uh, a curve ammo for frax ETH is uh really really good it's going to actually allow us to have uh the protocol earning part of the crv cvx rewards that then can get uh used to increase the bribes for the next period right and the bribes for the next period continue to get the flywheel going right and in in, in fact none of this is actually a kind of like, you know, something that is like reflexive on the way up and, and like non -ref like reflexive on the way down because Frax ETH is always one-to-one -one backed anyway. The worst thing that can possibly happen is uh, people just hate liquid staking derivatives and just sell all their Frax ETH into the uh, curve pool or something like like how Steve is a little depeg right now or whatever, right? And so people can just buy discounted liquid staking derivatives like like Fraxy, uh essentially so there's no there's no like ponzinomics to it or, or like you know there's no like reflexive up reflexive down it's it's only uh bootstrapping like flywheel up and and the only possible flywheel down is just people don't like liquid staking derivatives or something or the market takes a massive you know turn there, there's no situation where like there's like in insolvency or there's like not one-to-one -one backing with uh with ETH and, and things like that. Obviously that, that, that assumes like no software or hardware failure in terms of like massive slashing, but that's the same thing with Lido, right? Like if, if they have like massive, like, you know, slashing event or something that's equally bad, but like that just applies with everything. So, yeah. Yeah. 
Got it. That's a pretty solid over, overview of frac seed, especially with your plans and, you know, how you guys have created a sustainable flywheel and a very attractive option. And, you know, I've seen online many compliments about the frac seed design. Um, and the next thing at I want to, first, yeah. uh, <laughs> at first, a lot of people were asking us, why did you do this? Like, this is like, what, why does this, why do two tokens need to exist? And, and I think now people are like, oh, uh. <laughs> You know, it's like, yeah, we we definitely thought about this uh, extensively mm -hmm. before just uh, releasing it. Yeah. And another uh, product you guys just released uh, is Frax Ferry. Uh, I've been seeing a few proposals in the governance forums to deploy Frax Ferry to Moonbeam, to Optimism, to Arbitrum. Uh, can we go into Frax Ferry a little bit? Uh, by the way, I love how simple the docs are for it. It's very straightforward. It's just, this is Frax ETH. Here's some diagrams. Here's some points. Um and so I recommend everybody to read the docs on that because it's pretty easy to digest. Uh, so yeah, let's get into the Frax Ferry. What was your thinking behind it and how does it work and how does it compare to other bridges or would you even call, call it a bridge? But I'll let you get into it. Yeah, I I think so. The reason we even called it Frax Ferry, which is like, you know, a moniker of like, like a boat, which is not a bridge. It actually goes under bridges, right? Rather <laughs> than it being uh, an actual bridge is that it has a very specific uh, use case. And the specific use case is if there's uh, native fracs issued on other chains, we view ETH mainnet as the basically the most secure and you know canonical place that all like like a vast majority of the frax collateral system contracts and all of these things are located. So we needed a way for natively issued frax on other chains to be redeemed for one frax on ETH mainnet, where there that one frax is obviously can be, you know, sold into curve or redeemed uh, against the system contracts and stuff like that. So if we could design a method where it's safe and secure that you can take your natively issued frax on any chain and one-to-one -one, uh, minus a small fee, obviously get exactly one Fracks on ETH mainnet out of it, then then that's perfect. Then you have a situation where you can use uh, native fracks on other chains. By native, I mean fracks that's actually deployed by the Frax protocol, rather than you know fracks that's wrapped by any kind of bridge, right? Like not fracks that's wrapped by you know any swap or Nomad or or like Axelar or things like that. Just literally native fracks. If you could use this system like this Frax Ferry to come back to ETH mainnet essentially uh, and get one Frax for it, then you can basically be sure that all the Frax that are natively issued on different chains will always trade at the doll, especially if you could even go the other way, right? You could take Frax from ETH mainnet and then go to the other chains too and uh, get out native Frax over there, right? And basically uh, meet demand for Frax on these other chains. So that, that's the motivation with Frax Ferry is that um, I personally am, am not extremely, you know, bullish cross-chain bridges. And I think to be honest, uh, other than the word algorithmic stablecoin and FTX, bridges are the most dangerous <laughs> uh, words ever uttered in, in crypto. So I, we wanted to make sure we were basically coming up with a native safe method to redeem your frax across different chains. And so it's it's not a bridge, but I mean, in terms of, you know, conceptual things, if, if you if you think, you know, any kind of message passing in any in any way uh, is, is a bridge, then you could kind of say it's like a variation of a bridge. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's very safe and native in terms of uh, it's once every 24 hours between ETH mainnet and the other chain, uh, wherever the, the ferry actually goes. So there's a lot of protections about, you know, chain rollbacks on, you know, these other Altel ones or L2s or things like that. Um, there's, there's a lot of things that basically, if you already trust the Frax protocol to hold its stable coin, then you should just trust how to redeem it for one Frax on ETH mainnet, right? Versus if you were using a bridge for Frax, like let's say you were using, um, you know, like like any swap or or seller or something, you would have to trust 
the bridge as well to hold the fracks, right? As you wrap it into this, you know, new chain. Like if you're taking thousand fracks from ETH mainnet to Phantom, for example, through any swap, right? What happens is you get any swap wrapped fracks on Phantom, right? And a thousand fracks is held by any swap, right? And hopefully uh, they never get hacked, right? And hopefully they uh, have it and, in, in, you know, to any swaps credit, they've done a great job, but, but a lot of chains, uh, sorry, a lot of bridges can't say the same thing, right? And so you, you might not want to take that extra risk, right? In order to have uh, Frax on Phantom, you might not want to take the risk of already trusting the Frax protocol and additionally on top of that, trusting the uh, any swap protocol, right? And so Frax Ferry alleviates that in that you're still trusting uh, the Frax protocol, right? In fact, Maker also has this thing, I think they call the the fast withdrawal teleport bridge. Yeah. And they, they're thinking of uh, deploying it on all of the rollups, I believe. And I think this is a good move. I think the, that, again, you know, it might be my stablecoin maximalist side, you know, coming out and, and talking here. But I think that bridges don't make sense other than for stablecoin issuers to, you know, do them. Because if you hold a stablecoin, you're already trusting all of the trust assumptions of a stablecoin issue. You're already assuming their oracles are correct. You're already assuming their collateral is, is like solvent. You're already assuming that they, that those are all larger trust assumptions than like, you know, uh, a, a bridge, right? And you don't want to randomly take trusting a bridge from the outside and, and, and additionally trusting something completely uh, bespoke. You might as well just trust the native bridge of the the thing that you're already trusting the peg on, right? And so I think it's a, it was a great idea for Maker to do this. Um, I, I think USDC also uh, announced that their um, their Circle Converge conference, I think it was like last month or something, that they're getting into multi-chain uh, message passing. So it's basically a way where if you have USDC that's native on Solana, for example, and uh, you want USDC on ETH, you basically use their soon to be released system where you basically ping the Circle API or like, you know, uh, a, a website can do that or something. And then you sign a transaction and then you burn your USDC on Solana and then you get the uh, same amount of USDC on, on ETH mainnet minted by Circle. And so it's like, okay, if you already trust Circle to you know, with, with your basically storing your money essentially, right? By holding USDC in your wallet, you should probably at that point trust them to bridge it back to Ethereum compared to bridging it through some completely third party protocol or, or project. And so it's, this was the motivation with Frax Ferry. I think Frax Ferry is actually one of the uh, most elegant ways to do um, a hub and spoke system. So what that means is that basically ETH mainnet is the hub, right? And then all of the other chains where Frax is deployed uh, natively, they're the, uh, you know, they're the way that they basically can be redeemed on the central node, which is ETH mainnet, right? And they can also go out individually to these uh, in individual L1s and L2s that issue native Frax. Like we can even issue Frax on stuff like, uh, like, you know, Lightning Network or some, some of the kind of BTC uh, stuff that's kind of emerging like stacks and, and, and things like that if, if there's enough of a market there. It's exciting stuff, getting all the BTC people excited because I've had a few BTC people come up to me and say like, we want Frax on Lightning, we want Frax on, Bit on Bitcoin, which, you know, could be a really interesting development, what, like you said, once the demand is there. Um, and so the next thing I actually want to get into uh, where a lot of people have been coming up to me and asking me and Kit and other people questions is FPI and FPIS. You guys released it in the spring of this year um, and you have your Telegram emoji as the FPI logo. So what everybody wants to know is what's going on with FPI? Um, what are you most excited about for it? And you know what? And how does the team plan to uh, grow and expand FPI? Yeah, um, definitely. We we do have uh, a lot of plans for it, and it's actually important to note. Um, you know, when when people ask like, what's kind of the overarching like vision of like the the Frax protocol, right? 
Um, I still think, and I think people are, are, are discounting what the, the vision is, is that it's to build the greatest dollar peg stablecoin and its successor, whatever the successor to the dollar uh, stablecoin on chain is. And I think it's something like the FBI. So the FBI is actually meant to be the successor and next generation stablecoin um, compared to all the dollar ones that are there. Are, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about FRAX, you know, the dollar peg stablecoin, DAI, the dollar peg stablecoin, you know, USDC and, and all of these things because the dollar peg stablecoin space is really maturing and, you know, there's a lot of competition and, and like the, you know, like I said, the prize is like multi-trillion dollar market cap and stuff. I actually think the successor to the, the dollar peg stablecoin, like the next generation of stable coins that are pegged to non-nation state units of account, like the FPI, like other things that that'll come, uh, kind of what Ohm was originally, you know, saying it, it's going to be, uh, those kinds of things. It's, it's still very early, right? But for example, FPI has been growing steadily. Uh, I, I've been using it. A lot of people have been using it, but it's almost like kind of the, the best kept secret of, of DeFi, to be honest, because um, if it's pegged to the CPI, that's just another way of saying it's uh, inflation resistant, right? And it's uh, collateral tries to grow with the inflation rate. Obviously, it's it's uh, harder at larger market caps, but FPI has about a market cap of about 70 something million. So it's still quite small and, and uh, you know, new, but it's a uh, one of the best things to save in FPI units, FPI stable coins are the best thing to save in. So like when I actually have, you know, frack stable coins and, and things like that, if I don't know where to stake them, uh, if it's not convex, I just mint uh, FPI, right? Because you can just hold it in your wallet and it will grow against dollars at the rate of uh, inflation. And so I think the important overarching idea here is that the vision of FRAX is to build two stable coins. It's to build FRAX, the dollar peg stable coin, and also to disrupt the dollar peg stable coin industry uh, slowly, right? With whatever we think is the successor to uh, dollar units. And I think it's some form of CPI units that are pegged to a basket of consumer goods and then eventually, you know, entirely governed on chain. So it's, uh, it's good to always reframe and uh, make sure that people know that that's always kind of the ethos. There's a lot of stuff going on in Frax, right? There's Frax Swap, Frax Let, Frax ETH, and all these things, but they're all basically a means to an end of designing the two stable coins of the system, right? And that's why, for example, there's no there's no token for Frax Swap, right? Frax Len doesn't have its own token. Like, there's no like you know, Frax Len token that's like Comp or Ave or something, right? There's no like Frax ETH token uh, that, that governs just that like Lido's token or something, right? It's all FXS and then FPIS for, for the FBI stablecoin, right? And that's something that's done intentionally. There's no other, you know, we're not, you know, releasing governance tokens and, and trying to play that game and stuff. And like I was saying, before when I was talking about the, the Fed master account stuff, we want to make sure to keep all of the incentives aligned and actually uh, stay focused, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of cool things coming up with, with FBI. So we have VEFPIS, which is similar to FXS uh, staking, but it's it's a little bit different. There's actually uh, different things we can add on to it, like slashing conditions and different kinds of voting methods for VEFPIS. And it's actually very cool and it'll be released in stages. And so you can uh first just obviously stake the fbis um get yield and and get you know part of the cash flow above uh inflation that's that's in the treasury but then later you can actually vote on the cpi gauge weights with uh different types of rules and slashing conditions and things like that so it'll actually be very very uh different in the medium to long term than vfxs so there's a lot of cool stuff coming up and uh, yeah, and, and I highly recommend people that are interested in stable coins to check out FPI, even though it's uh, still early and kind of the, you know, the, the idea will uh, be very, very, you know, talked about in my opinion, in the next like six to 12 months, right? Because the, the thing is right now, 
uh, all eyes are on kind of the, the dollar peg, you know, stable coin industry, the regulation for it and, you know, what's going to happen. And a lot of people are, are missing the, you know, the next thing, what comes after that. So, yeah. yeah. It's like you guys are taking the Netflix approach to stable coins. And what I mean by that is Netflix just started delivering DVDs, but they knew that was going to be disrupted. They knew that streaming was going to be the next big thing. And instead of DVDs, you basically have currency and, uh, that you're disrupting is you have your like, you know, instead of delivering DVDs, you have your stable dollar peg stable coin. And what the next thing is and what you're seeing in the future is FPI, which is really cool. Uh, Kit, I know you're about to say something. Did you have any questions? Yeah, I, I do. Uh, but first, I just wanted to comment that it's it's so funny that's you know, Sam and the frag team is like, we're going to build the best damn USD stable coin there is. And then we're going to disrupt ourselves and create this FPI. So I, you know, <laughs> uh, applaud to the team to, to, you know, self rug for innovation. A, <laughs> so, uh, this is a creative uh, destruction, gotta, creative destruction. Keep innovating, uh, right? Yeah. yeah. Yep. And, and I do have a, a yeah. question in terms of, you know, we're all talking about the greatness of FPI and FPIS. And I, I, I want to, you know, have some critique on how do you ensure, I feel like there's a cap or a scale issue. Once FPI becomes, say, you know, two billion dollars, and now you have to keep up with inflation with two billion dollars of collateral, like, how do you kind of execute on that, right? Yeah, and I and does that uh, go ahead? That's that's a great question, and and like to be honest, so so like that's also part of the reason uh, right now, um, you know, just just to you know be completely forthright, the reason it's. The, the peg is great and and it's fully collateralized and everything and it's growing with inflation is because the market cap 70 something million right and and it's it's pretty easy to keep up with uh inflation when it's uh it's so small now when um the you know the market cap gets into the the billions it's going to be a very difficult to find uh places where basically are collateral types or yields that uh, are as efficient as the, the demand for consumer items, right? The other way to say that is you need to back FPI with things that are as efficient as the demand for the consumer items, right? Like food, energy, uh, cars, you know, uh, medical care, all of these things that are in the CPI. The other thing to say about that is, well, once those basket of items are being uh, decided by governance, right, by the FPIS <laughs> holders, uh, you'll actually know what the, the peg target is that it's going to hit. So if, for example, the inflation rate, you know, goes to hopefully not, but in the US, if it goes like 30 or 40%, and an FPI is actually multiple, uh, you know, billions of dollars, one of two things has to happen. Either there has to be uh, a, a cap on, on the growth, which is kind of a funny situation, right? Because uh, unlike most startups where you're like, who will use this? It's more like everyone will use this. You have to cap the actual uh, supply or two, uh, you have to actually have the community decide on what the true inflation rate is and what basket of consumer items you can reasonably peg to, right? Because eventually the that will come up as, as a governance vote uh, in and of itself. So It'll be interesting to to see as, as it grows, but right now um, it's extremely uh, workable. There's actually profitable um, in terms mm -hmm. of like there's more backing uh, to FBI than even 100% uh, CR. And again, it's because the market cap is small, but but it's really good. So it's one of DeFi's kind of best kept yield secrets. Yeah, for sure. Because FPI is like a fraction of the curve AMO right now, right? It's easy peasy to keep on printing way above the, <laughs> the benchmark. So, you know, I, and my, that's my only concern is that there's going to come a time where FPI hits a cap and it, it just becomes way too difficult. And that would eat into, you know, FRAX's AMO's yields. Because again, like the, the collateral of FPI is FRAX, right? So- Yeah, there'd have to be different places, right? Like there have yeah, to, has be, to be- Yeah, uh, to be. They're basically, the other way to put it, is the on-chain economy has to at least be growing in productivity faster than inflation, right? So the, 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 that's the other yep. way to put it, right? The other way to put it mm -hmm. is that there has to be places on the blockchain where 
the productivity is growing at a rate that consumers are demanding, you know, consumer items in, in the CPI. If there isn't, then it's it basically becomes mathematically impossible for there to be enough productive assets for for backing FPI at large market caps. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And go ahead, Dave. Uh, did you have any more questions about FPI? Because I want to get into uh, another criticism and facts that I heard from a few people. And I'm yeah, interested no, no. in Sam. I'm interested in rolling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, something uh, I've heard from uh, multiple people from the Frax community as well is Frax's reliance on the Curve ecosystem, which has obviously been a star worth of Frax. I don't think Frax would be where it is without Curve. And like uh, in the same way, I don't think Curve would be where it is without Frax. And, you know, this mutually beneficial relationship between the two protocols as well as Convex. But some people are saying like uh, Frax is relying too much on Curve. Um, how would you retort this? Uh, does Frax plan to work with other protocols and ecosystems? Uh, what is your take on, you know, the relationship between Frax and Curve? Is it too much or would you like to, or would you retort that? Yeah, I, I think you said it uh, perfectly in, in at the beginning where um, Frax does rely a lot on Curve. And to be honest, Frax is so big that so does the other way around, right? Like Frax actually, um, if, if Frax disappeared, I think a lot of the, uh lubrication and like the bribe fly flywheel and the and the liquidity provided in curve would uh be significantly reduced so it's it's literally the definition of positive sum so like by doing this and working together there's like uh a lot of uh you know value created basically out of thin air like if, if we disappeared or if curve disappeared the total value overall would would be lower now um one of the things were always known for, and I, I reiterate, is we're, we're willing and excited to literally work with anyone. Uh, and as long as it's in good faith, and as long as the idea is to work to create value, like positive sum, we will collaborate with anyone. In fact, sometimes I hear people saying like, oh, like, you guys, you know, want to do a pool with like Steeth and, and Fraxeth? Or, or like, no, like, do you, do you see them as like, you know, competition or something? And it, it just, um, it, it actually surprises me that anyone would even think to see things like that or like, no, don't, don't do this with them or don't do that with the, this one. And like, we're trying to, you know, uh, hurt this project so that we can grow faster or something. And I just think that that stuff is super misguided. We've never, ever uh, had any of that ethos, right? Our ethos is always, if we can work with other people to create value, uh, that's, 100% of the time what, what we want to do, right? In fact, um, I would I would love to see a world where Frax is at a trillion dollar you know market cap, but so are other stable coins, right? I don't want Frax to be the you know the only stable coin at like two or three trillion. I want two or three stable coins to be at around a trillion each. That's the that's an ideal uh world that I think is uh is really good. And so the answer is definitely yes. We we love to work with basically anyone in, in good faith. And I think our actions show that. Now, to answer concretely, like what kind of places or things do you want to, you know, build that lowers your, you know, reliance on like curb and things like that? Well, that's why we built you know, Frax Lend in terms of backing Frax with over collateralized lending and kind of innovative. Uh, collateral and things like that. That's why we've also uh, built FraxSwap, which is an AMM for rebalancing different kinds of liquidity uh, internally. But then other than that, if you think about it, the only things that you can really back Frax with other than these things, right? If you look around the stablecoin landscape is real world assets, right? And we started this conversation <laughs> about real world assets and in my opinion uh, about them. So in fact, it, it also kind of, you know, you know, completes the circle in the sense that all things, if you're a dollar peg stable coin kind of come full circle. And it's, a, it's like, are you going to have any kind of fiat coin exposure, which is in our case, part of why we rely on curve and in Dai's case, why they have like four or 5 billion USDC sitting in their, you know, PSM contract or something, right? Or if the answer to that is no, um are you going to have a fed master account right yeah and and so we're obviously working on on all of those things well would i guess uh what people like want to know about is 
would Frax try to work with or expense uh, other AMMs in the future? I mean, I know last year you guys had the G Uni pool with uh, Dai and Frax, but would uh, Frax be interested in working? Because a, a lot of, I feel like every other week, a different uh, Uni V3 manager comes to me uh, saying like, hey, like, is there a way we could like work with Frax, this and that? So like, what's your take on the Uni Uniswap V3 and its structure? And like, if like there's a way like Frax can expand over there? Well, we're one of the largest uh, tokens on Uniswap. I think we're number five or something. And yeah, that's true. We have protocol controlled liquidity on, on Uniswap. And we also uh, do have Uniswap gauges on, on like for FXS emissions. And so we, we love Uniswap. Obviously, it's Uniswap. And so um, mm -hmm. in terms of the liquidity managers, we're always down to talk, but we we all already kind of manage, you know, with, with AMOs are like stablecoin liquidity on Uniswap, if there's more interesting strategies uh, of like managing different kinds of assets as needed, um, always down to, you know, get those intros. Yeah. Um, and I want to go back to something you said earlier um, and said, there's no token for Fraxland. There's no token for FraxSwap. And I heard your recent interview with CoinGecko. And I assume the reason for that is, you know, with the DeFi, with the um, stablecoin, uh, Trinity, a uh, DeFi Trinity, I mean, um, you view lend lending, liquidity, and currency all as the same thing. They're really just different parts of the same body. Um, and that's the reason why that there's no to uh, separate token for each different primitive. Um, and I'm just wondering, like, how do you plan to uh, grow adoption and get adoption for FraxLend and FraxSwap? Like, how would you get, like, how would you get other tokens to, you know, instead of going to a different AMM or something like, how could you get them to come to Frax swap? Or if instead of, you know, how could you get other tokens to come to Frax line? Like, do you see like, maybe they can get like a package deal or something? Like, what are, you, what are your thoughts on, you know, getting adoption? Yeah, uh, I do see them all as the same thing. So you, you said it uh, quite well in terms of them being kind of the the same body, right? <laughs> uh, and And so, I think we'll see more and more of that, right? With with Aave's stablecoin release, with uh, Curve's stablecoin release, and they they just they're all kind of the the same infrastructure for issuing uh, digital currency uh, and and backing it with different types of loans and having a place that's uh, with liquidity to redeem or deploy, you know, protocol collateral to, right? And so. They are the same thing. It's just, uh, it's just, it took the industry a while to build each individual one of these things and then combine them, right? <laughs> uh, and I think we're already seeing a lot of Frax Lend growth and Frax Swap growth, and it's only going to get uh, more and more attractive to use it. It's obviously the beginning is is what's difficult, but we have. Um, let me actually uh, pull it up. I can tell you the the stats um, on everything. We have about uh, just under um, 130 million uh, TVL in frac swap pools. And we have um, just over 47 million total supply of fracs to be borrowed on FraxLend. And about 15 million of that is already borrowed for a utilization of uh, right around 55%. And things are growing. They're growing pretty quickly, even in this bear market, right? In this bear yeah. market, you expect things to be going down, right? A instead of up and, uh, you know, to, to the right, you expect them to be going down, but they're actually growing. And I think it'll actually be better and better as there's network effects, liquidity effects, as Frax becomes safer, hopefully with, you know, dollars at the Fed backing it, right? And it's not this kind of, um, you know, innovative, but riskier kind of asset. It's actually becomes as safe as U USDC, hopefully, and then things like that, right? So I think it's just going to get better and better overall. So there's already a lot of uh, usage of, of these platforms like FraxSwap and FraxLend and FraxEth, like we were saying, and in, in a bear market. Imagine when, uh, hopefully... Um, Jerome Powell decides to, you know, let off the the interest rate hikes and <laughs> some breathing room. Imagine the uh, 
the flywheels and kind of the the bull market then yeah like you said the hardest part is the beginning but you know once you get traction it's that snowball effect and you know as fax grows and becomes an attractive option for new protocols or even older protocols, you know, that want like the full financial suite, like, hey, like come over to Frax, you get a Frax swap pair and you get a Frax lend, you get the one, two punch package, um, which would be really cool to see. Um, something else I want to ask is, do you envision, how do you envision, you know, builders and the community building around Frax on top of Frax with Frax? Because, you know, you guys already developed a solid foundation with all the primitives you built, but, you know, it'd be really cool if, you know, maybe there's like, Frax perps or like Frax options or anything like that. Like if there was like a Frax hackathon per se, like what kind of products and primitives would you like to see built? Yeah, uh, but that's a great question. Obviously I really like GMX and, and the, you know, shout out to the team over there that they're doing some really cool stuff and perp protocol as well. So like, obviously there's no native kind of Frax perps and things like that, but uh, Frax is integrated in both of them, right? You could use Frax uh, as, as collateral and per protocol. It's in GLP and then things like that. I think more uh, close collaboration in, in that area with, with GMX per protocol or even like a, a positive sum product, like you're saying, in terms of like a Frax per product that integrates like different designs from GMX and, and uh, you know, perhaps like uses GLP and, and things like that. So it helps everyone grow. That's a really good idea. Um, other things, perhaps like, um, you know, just building on top of things like Frax Swaps, TWAM, uh, Frax Lens, like isolated lending pairs. There's probably like different things to do there. For example, um, Frax Lens pairs are independent. So you can basically loan, uh, if you're like a Frax user, you can lend your like Frax in different places and get, you know, different interest, right? Like, so if there's a CRV Frax, Frax Lend pair, you know, you can put your Frax in there and people can borrow that Frax with CRV collateral. Or if there's like a uh, Weath Frax, Frax Lend pair, you can lend your Frax in there and people can use Weath as collateral and borrow it. Um, building kind of vaults where, you know, someone deposits, you know, their Frax into your Frax Lend vault and then it kind of manages the best places in, in Frax Lend to deposit it to maximize your interest rate kind of like a yearn for Frax Lend, right? Like you can basically deposit uh, Frax stable coins in this vault and it'll manage the best places to get interest in, in different Frax Lend pairs. That would be really cool. Um, at Frax Hackathon sounds great, actually. Like we should totally uh, do that and, and uh, support a lot of the builders and get FXS grants and things like that. You heard it here first, guys. Frax Hackathon could or could not be in the pipeline. We'll see in the near future. <laughs> let's do it yeah it is for sure in the near future <laughs> spoiler spoiler <laughs> uh you know sam i i wanted to ask you know more into like what kind of kpi or metrics does the team track on a daily basis in terms of like uh evaluating each of the products, right? Do, do you guys have a specific dashboard for each product and a certain number? Like, hey, you want the utilization on Frax Lend to be, you know, always above 55 or anything of that nature? Um, no, we don't really have like, you know, super like rigid things, but we actually, so we built a dedicated uh, analytics suite for the entire Frax economy. Uh, and it's called uh, Frax Facts. And you can actually go and see it at facts.frax.finance. Um, and it has a tab for everything from, you know, Frax BP to Frax Lend to Frax ETH to Frax Swap Pools, um, all of these things. Uh, in fact, you could like see the balance sheet of backing, you know, Frax ETH and soon the Frax stablecoin itself and all of these things. We don't really have a concrete thing of like, oh, like why is the Frax Lend total utilization under 60 or things like that. As long as there's clear product market fit and growth, which there is across, uh, thankfully, across all of the things that we've released, um, we just want to make sure that everything is working exactly as designed. It, there isn't like any kind of crypto economic mistakes. Like for example, if we were wrong about the Frax ETH two token design, right? We would have to address it, right? We'd have to either go back to the drawing board or restructure it and things like that. So we look at big picture stuff rather than 
you know, like these like specific, um, you know, random kind of like KPIs. We look at kind of the big picture. Is it working as designed? Is it, does it work as intended? Is there anything that's not working the way that we uh, intended it to work? And so far, um, you know, everything seems to be working in that way. And, and that's really good. Yeah. Um, something I wanted to ask is, you know, at the beginning of the interview, you talked about how you have all this frax that's locked up for X amount of time, but obviously like those locks are going to expire or end at some point. And that frax will be, you know, released into the wider ecosystem. Um, so on, on a long-term basis, have you thought about uh, ways to keep frax locked and like create like new cool ways to make sure frax stays locked and that liquidity stays locked? Cause that's pretty vital for the protocol's health as I'm, I'm sure you, you know, pretty well. Um, so what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, there's uh, all of these new gauges that, that are released, right? You can all always lock uh, and get um, higher APR on those. So there's always, as people come in and go, there's there's more lockers that come in as, as locks uh, expire. So there's like more than enough lock liquidity. Now, the again, the, the big picture stuff, I think... The right way to do it is have a collateral ratio of 100 and the collateral ratio basically actually is redefined to the the ratio of you know dollars uh at the fed that frax actually is backed by versus uh different amos and so when you add up those things you get 100 but then the cr effectively is 100 so actually if there's no lock liquidity at all it's not even uh, critical mm. to the protocol's development. So that's, I think, the, the way, like I was saying at the beginning of this uh, conversation, to have essentially the 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 risk-free stablecoin, kind of like USDC. It's a, you have to become that model, right? Otherwise, you're going to end up walking the spectrum of, of more and more risk, right? Like real-world assets that can default or like, you know, um, collateralization mm -hmm. that's like under uh, 100% and, and things like that. And so I think that the, the way to do it is even though there's more than enough lock liquidity, it's to go about this way where, you know, the CR is back basically at a hundred. Yeah. So uh, yeah, hundred percent collateral ratio is the target. Yes. Yeah. I can't, you were going to say something. Yeah. I just want to kind of bring it a full circle here and, you know, talk about the uh, FMA again, and because that's clearly going to be the number one killer thing that's going to happen for Frax. Like Sam, let's fast forward. And now let's say Frax does have an FMA account and it's all ready to go. Like, could you explain like I'm five, how that flywheel looks like? Is it, does it become another AMO equivalent or literally collateral will be transferred into US dollar deposited into the Fed's ledger? Yeah, that's the thing. There doesn't have to be a, a flywheel when when we have that, right? Exactly. You right. just actually have one to one uh, dollars backing uh, the frac stablecoin that that you know um, people can redeem against, right? And and at that point, the whole thing speaks for itself. It's like, well, do you want to use this, or do you want to use uh, you know Tether or USDC or or something like that? And I think. At that point, you know, we could confidently say that we're uh, as safe, if not safer, slightly than than USDC. And in fact, I mean, I assume USDC is probably trying to get the same thing. So we would basically become the, you know, the closest thing in terms of both of us being like the risk-free uh, stablecoin. There doesn't have to be a flywheel for that. It's not like the Fed has a flywheel. <laughs> right. Yeah. The Fed is the flywheel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Another thing I want to get into is, you know, obviously this cycle, uh, Cosmos gained a lot of steam. Um, and I wanted to ask, and a few projects have come up to me and say, hey, is Frax going to go to Cosmos? When is Frax going to be on more Cosmos chains? Um, does Frax have, you know, with Frax starting out, uh, does Frax have any plans of bridging over to Cosmos or create a Cosmos native Frax version at all? Yeah, um, right. With Frax Ferry, um we can definitely explore having native fracks on some Cosmos chains. Now, I think Cosmos is a pretty interesting ecosystem. We're quite uh, EVM heavy in terms of both our expertise and, you know, like you're saying, the end game of having like a frax chain as kind of a ZK rollup uh, mm -hmm. ecosystem. But um, we're open to it. 
we, you know, to be clear right now, we don't have any plans of, you know, launching Frax chain or anything in the future as like a Cosmos chain, but mm -hmm. some kind of IBC compatibility, I think is crucial as the Cosmos ecosystem basically becomes uh, substantive enough to, you know, you can't ignore it, right? Um, but mm -hmm. if uh, anyone is really, you know, big in the Cosmos ecosystem wants to help us explore that, we're, like I said, always positive, some always willing to build in, in that direction. Yeah, so um, in terms of like far out, like having Frax Chain as a ZK rollup and having basically instead of like the settlements happening on ETH, the settlements would happen on the rollup essentially. So that's still like far out into the future. And so like if it were to happen, it would probably be its own ZK rollup as like an L2 or an L3 or something. Oh, um, are you muted? What happened? Oh, Sam, you're muted. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm uh, I'm sorry, guys. I got rugs. The internet just cucked out on me. <laughs> it's oh. dangerous to do long podcasts. You know. Yeah. You I think able to cut a few times really well. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I think that's a a sign. Uh, I have one last question, and then we can get into the uh, rapid fire questions. Um. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we went over a lot in this interview. Um, and I think we see pretty clear, like where the roadmap is heading. So, but I want to ask to like, make sure we have it concretely said, um, what is in the immediate roadmap for Frax in like the next six months and like long-term vision, like where do you see Frax a year, a few years from now? Yeah. Like, like again, the, the Frax total, uh, you know, vision is two stable coins that are revolutionary for crypto, the dollar pegged Frax stable coin and the successors of the dollar Peg stable coins in FPI. Okay. Um, and in the medium term, obviously, we hopefully will see all of the infrastructure that we built around the Frax economy kind of like 10, 20x in, in growth, like uh, Frax ETH, Frax Lend, uh, Frax Swap, and, and these things. It's important to note, by the way, just so I explain this, we're building all of these things for a particular purpose, like you're saying, in terms of you know, a specific roadmap to accomplish our, our goal. Like we're not just aimlessly deciding to build Fraxeth because we think it's cool, right? Like we're not just doing stuff that, you know, we, we think is, is kind of like fun or, or whatever. Like we're not building an NFT marketplace, right? Or like we're not building like, you know, a um, blockchain phone or whatever. I don't know, whatever Solana was, was doing or, or something like that. <laughs> like we're building stuff that's like very, very, uh, directly, you know, equivalent to our mission of advancing these two stable coins. And for example, obviously FraxLend, FraxSwap uh, does that. And FraxEth actually fits into that vision in, in an interesting way uh, as well. In fact, you know, one of the things that I always say is like, if we're going to be the most important entity on ETH mainnet, uh, we're going to want to have um, a, a large say in, in ETH consensus, right? We're going to have to be able to uh, build blocks, right? And so that that's how Frax ETH fits in there. So yeah, mm. got it. Exciting stuff. Um, and Sam, uh, we really thank you for coming on. Um, you know, giving us the full rollout on the next phase of Frax growth and adoption. And um, you know, you've been on the podcast two times before, so. Uh, we always see rapid fire, but we wanted to bring on some new rapid fire questions. So we'll get that started. Um, Kit, I'll let you go with the first one. All right. I will start. Sam, what is your morning routine? Oh, uh, down a Red Bull and get on my first call. <laughs> <laughs> what At what time? Context matters. Oh, oh my God. Various times. Like it, it could be as early as like... 6 7 a.m or i could be going to bed at 6 7 a.m and waking up at like 11 a.m <laughs> really just depends got it all right dave yeah. yeah um who is a hero or role model of yours um that's a good question honestly i i think in crypto it's probably you know someone like vitalik to be honest because everything uh he's done well you know is is like something to, to really think about how to do uh for fracks and stuff like i was saying before it's like 
making sure there aren't any like perverse incentives, may, you know, aligning stuff properly for, for being truly long-termist rather than being like, how can I raise more money? How can I release one more token or how can I do this and that? So I think Vitalik is probably one of the best, you know, role models for this space. Agreed. Uh, Kit, you got the next one. And uh, what is your lifting routine? What are you dead lifting? Oh, that's a good one. Okay. So I, <laughs> um, I usually lift three to four times a week, but I, I go pretty hard. Like I do like three hours and uh, I usually do like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and I do um, either squat, deadlift and bench in that order. Um, and I do the compound lift for like two plus hours. So like I, I do heavy squat on squat day, heavy bench on, you know, bench day and like, you know, heavy deads and variations and stuff on, on deadlift day. And I basically do heavy power lifting. Um, and I try to at least make sure to be, um, at minimum three times a week. I think I've, I've had that like streak literally for, let's see, probably like running on three years now without missing a single week of at least lifting three times, no matter where I am. Yeah. Um, what is your nutrition and diet, um, regimen? when you left to be honest it's not that good uh I know <laughs> like, oh my god you lifted but like it's I've, I've never been the type of person to count calories i've never been the type of person to be like oh i need to take uh protein powder and like you know mix this and mix that and stuff i just really really care about lifting lifting good lifting heavy lifting a lot uh doing a lot of the difficult lifts and not doing you know too much like you know cute stuff or whatever just going hard uh, I don't really, to be honest, care about uh, all of the extra kind of eating stuff. I'll, I'll eat McDonald's or like I'll have a beer after my lift or something. <laughs> I, don't, I really don't care. Like, so like well, one of the things like I just, uh, I just eat. The Chad dirty bulk versus the virgin <laughs> clean eating. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> it definitely sounds like a, a, a dirty bulk. Uh, no cardio, no stretching. We're going to go in here and just lift hard. <laughs> we're just going to push weight around. Man, that th this has been such an awesome call, Sam. I think we need to do this at least once a quarter, almost like a state of frax address, you know, to the union here. I, I think we definitely need to have more of these uh, earning calls type situations. <laughs> quarter, uh, quarter recap on, on Flywheel. I'm always there. Yeah. Hell yeah. Definitely need that. All right. Dave, you want to sign us out? Yeah. Sam, thanks so much for coming on. Like this has been a super informative podcast. Um, a lot of new info, a lot of new meta uh shared here. And you know, I think this will define the narrative in the months and uh quarters and years to come. So thank you again for coming on. Of course, it's always fun and uh I'll be back soon. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Max. Thanks. See ya. See ya. Thank you everyone for tuning in to this episode of Flywheel Pod. This was a dense, meaty episode. A lot of new ideas, a lot of new things thrown out here. And this is the first time I've heard of a DeFi protocol of any time say, we're going for a Fedmaster account. And I think this was really the crown jewel of the episode. And now that this idea is out in the ether, no pun intended, you know, I'm sure Frex won't be the only one trying to go for this. Uh, Kit, do you have any final thoughts on the episode? Bro, you literally took the words out of my mouth. It's going to be like, oh, I also am going for a FMA. Oh, a yeah. master account? I'll take one of those. Like everyone in DeFi is going to start singing this new narrative as Frax kind of always does when they lead the narrative. Um, uh, one thing I do want to note to the listeners is like Frax is kind of getting to a point where you can no longer be the lazy researcher. You really have to actually pay attention now just because there are so many different uh, products and like the verticals are expanding both horizontally and vertically. So you, you really need to step up your research during this bear market right now and pay attention. You know, don't don't get distracted by, you know, price down only and, and be vigilant and always be learning. Yeah, this is the time to build. And, you know, at Flywheel Pod, we'll be here every week. Uh, we have a lot of cool things being built in the pipeline uh, that you're seeing in the near future. So definitely pay attention to that to aid in that research. Um, but, you know, I think this is a, one of those evergreen milestone episodes. And it's going to be interesting and cool to look back, you know, a few months from now or even a year, a few years from now to say, like, this is where the idea was, you know, first uttered into the universe and seeing, like, what will happen and materialize 
after. So really excited stuff happening for Frax. And Frax is actually growing in this time, even though it's a bear market and it seems like Dow only. Hell, Frax uh, expanded their AMLs for Frax land as if you paid attention to Frax check from 5 million to 15 million on certain pairs. And, you know, we're going to keep growing and keep grinding from here. Right. And Frax ETH is also up to the right, always increasing number yeah. of, of Frax ETH up all only. the time. Exactly. Yeah. And on top of that, Sam also said that, you know, we're going to have a quarterly kind of check in almost like an earnings call equivalent, some kind of uh, keynote special every quarter, just so we stay uh, updated and keep on pushing forward. Yeah, it's gonna be really exciting stuff. Um, and I'm excited to get that started. Like, I'm really looking forward to 2023. And you know, this is a, we build in a bear, we grind in a bear. Yep. You know, this is when the tourists leave. And this is when we, you know, get back to our roots and, you know, aren't distracted anymore. Um, our people aren't distracted anymore. But anyways, thank you everyone for watching. Um, if you like what you saw, let us know in the comments, give us a like, subscribe, hit that bell button on YouTube. Uh, if you want to keep up with us, follow us on Twitter at FlywheelPod. If you're enjoying the discussion, join FlywheelPod on Telegram. You can follow me on Twitter at DeFiDave22. You can follow me at 0x capital underscore K. And we'll see you next week. Peace. Peace.